on the, these things that we saw here, right? So just to remind you, if you do spectral analysis, you get these, these uh, pictures that explain the reaction, tell you what the metastable states are. But as I was saying, um, we, we need to try to make all of this a bit more practical because spectral analysis in high dimension is not uh, easy to do. Okay. So, at least possible. So, what we're going to do now is I'm going to explain to you how you can go about that. And what I will essentially, the whole lecture will be about um, something we call transition path theory, which will have a direct link with what I had discussed before. But it's a, a tool to actually uh, understand the mechanism of a specific reaction and thereby define what is the right reaction coordinate. All, and if they are half for the reaction, what's the rate, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, and so the idea is, so what we're going to do is something which is slightly less ambitious than the, the spectral theory. The spectral theory has no input except for the equation itself. What we're going to do now is we're going to assume that somehow we are targeting specific reaction that we want to analyze so that we have identified two states or sets in the configuration or phase space of the system which are the reactant and the product. And we, so we're going to assume that we know what these states are. So in, in simple 2D example like this, they would simply be like little circles that I can place somewhere in my system. Let's say I'll declare this as being reactant and that one as product. If we look at more complicated example, we will have to define that a bit more precisely. And typically, what we're going to do is if you have a molecule, you could, for example, you know, I don't know, you have alanine dipeptide, so you know that there's a conformation change, and you know that the two conformer can be identified with one diagonal angle. So you would say reactant is when the diagonal angle is between this and this value, and product is when the diagonal angle is between this and this value. So that defines sets in the full configuration space of the system that would be the view of this thing. But what I'm doing is just keep thinking about this on low dimensional itself. Okay? So here's a little cartoon, right? You need to imagine uh, that you have one of these landscapes, could be high dimensional, and I identify an A and a B which is my reactor and my product. So if I were to let the system evolve by itself, Right. What it would do is the dynamics is uh, the one that I wrote there before. Is that th this system would visit all possible locations in its phase space, and we do that with a probability that is consistent with the equivalent probability eventually. Right. So, in particular, if these are the bottom of two wells, it would spend a lot of time here and then a lot of time there, and overall, not so much time anywhere else. But from time to time, you would observe that there is a transition where the system goes from here to there. It's the equivalent of the system doing this and then coming back. Okay. So if I imagine that I have a very long trajectory, I can prune out of this trajectory the pieces during which it reacts. I don't know if you see the color, but so if this is a cartoon of a trajectory, the red pieces are the pieces during which the trajectory leaves the reactant and flies to the product without returning to the reactant in between. Okay. In fact, in all of the examples that I showed before, you only saw reactive trajectory. This is an example of reactive trajectory. You don't see it, it was the red patch. So the reactive trajectory themselves can be very complicated. But the way this trajectory was obtained is that you let the system run for very, very long here, and then at some point, you will observe that uh, most of the time it leaves this set, come back, leave, come back, leave, come back. But at some point, you will observe that there's a trajectory where it leaves this set, and then the next thing it does is enter here. So if I look at what happened between these two times, I would see this. Okay? And then there's many, many others. So this is what the cartoon is here. Of course, I draw it more simply. It could be much more wiggly than that reality. But it's, so this is that. And so I have one here. Then the system came back to A. And there's another one where it went to B. So here's two reactive trajectories. 
And I could imagine that if I have a very, very long trajectory, I would collect in, in, in many of these. And I want to know what are the statistical properties. Because I claim that if I want to understand the reaction, I'd really like to try to understand what is the reaction, the, the property of these trajectories. And that will mean what is their probability density, but also what's the current, the probability current associated with them, which you will connect to the probability current that we have discussed before. Okay, so um, I'll take a little bit of time. I will discuss that in the example of the maze. Okay, and, and in order to do that, I will introduce you to something that I think it's useful for you to know it anyway, uh, which is it's a node of Markov process. Instead of being um, instead of being governed by an overtime Langevin equation, this is a system that is a, a Markov jump process like the maze. So the little maze that was there, the simulation we saw at the beginning, the way this was done was that it was a walker where every square in the maze was a state. So the walker is in one square and it can, at, at every unit of time, it can pop at random into any one of the neighbors, okay, with equal probability, except that you only count the neighbors that you can that it can reach without crossing a wall. Right. Okay. So that's a, the, this is a Markov chain. Who, who knows a little bit about Markov chain? Discrete time Markov chain. Okay. So the, the idea is that they, they are completely specified. So I'll first read you that, then I'll, I'll give you a few formulas. On the next slide, and I'll write on the board so that we have them. They are completely specified in the discrete set. So, in the discrete setup, the state space is discrete and time is discrete too. So, in the case of the maze, the state space is just the index of every square in the maze. Okay? You denote them by i, j, k, etc., etc. Right? And then the work, the position of the work is, is denoted by x. And then at any given time, it is in one state. So, for example, at time t, it was in state i. And then to specify the dynamics, you just need to know what's the probability transition matrix that one step, which gives you the probability. So, pij is a probability that gives you that the walker will be at state j at time t plus 1, given that it was at time t at state i. This is the pij that we get. Right? So, this pij, I'll write it here. It's called, it's called a stochastic matrix or a transition matrix, PIJ. And it obviously satisfies the following two conditions, which is that if you sum over J is equal to 1, that means that the, that the worker cannot get out of the system. But if you sum over all states, you need to go somewhere, and the probability that it goes somewhere is, is equal to 1. Note that J could be I in this situation. It could be that it stays where it is. And then there's another uh, condition which is that this needs to be big or equal to zero. It's a probability. Okay. These two together imply that this also needs to be less than one. That's really a probability. Because if you sum positive numbers and they, they sum needs to be equal to one, then they individually they need to be uh, less than one. So this needs to be true for all states in the system, and this needs to be true for all pairs of states in the system. Okay. So I have a, I have a little slide here that summarizes there's a lot of formulas, but they're actually all quite generally, so I'll just go through them and I'll write the main one. Uh, that summarizes all you need to know if you want to you know, know mark of change. That's not true actually. But, but it's, uh, okay, so so there is the walker. Okay, the, the, the difficulty here is that I have to know the time by n instead of t because it's this thing. Okay, so n here is time. And xn was what I denoted by xt on the, on the previous slide. Sorry about this. So, if you want to look, so you can do two things. If you were to do a, 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 a Markov Monte Carlo, which is what was used to generate the movie that you saw, okay, what you would do is you, you, you put your dot, you, you walk her somewhere, and then you use pij to determine where it will go. You make it up and then you repeat, and you can do Monte Carlo. But that's generating a trajectory. An X-N or X-T. Now, if I want to analyze the probability of this trajectory, what I need to know is what is the probability 
you are, so it's the probability that at time n, the process has stayed high. Okay. E. So to this guy, let me write here. And we have this object, and then you have uh, D also. So we have mu i n, which is the probability that x n is at state i. Okay. And the way it evolves is actually quite simple. This is the rule, which is it says that the probability to find the, the worker at state i at time n plus 1 is simply what you do is you, you count all the possible ways to get there. So he says, well, it had to be at state j at time n, and from j it had to up to i. Okay, so you get this equation. Now you can rewrite it in a way which is a little bit more convenient uh, for what will follow, which is that you can split this sum into the off diagonal term and the diagonal one. Then you can use the fact that PII is 1 minus the sum of the off diagonal term, that's because the total sum is equal to 1. And then if you, if you look at this, you put the mu i on this side and you get this equation. This is saying that, uh, so what this is, what you see here is that this is a source term uh, and this is a sink term. Right? It says this is all the possible way the system goes into state i starting from j. Okay, so that's what will increase the probability to be in that state. And these are all the possible way the system escapes state i to go to another j. Okay? So that's the way you will lose probability. So at every step, the, the probability difference that you have between what was there at state n and what was there at state n plus 1 can be written in this balance equation like this. Okay? And, and in fact, uh, you know, this equation is completely equivalent to the one that is there. It's just, it's a bit e easier to interpret this. Well, actually, they are both easy to interpret. This one will be easy in the middle. Okay? So I'll write the, that one down. It says that mu uh, i n plus 1 minus mu i n is equal to the sum for j not equal to i of the source e j i minus the sigma. Right? I mean, is everybody with me? This is not it, it depends. So you can always think about a Markov chain as a network, right? Where the nodes are denoted by i, okay? And the edges, which are directed edge, are given by pij, okay? So you can think about it for in the example of the maze, the PIJ is a very sparse matrix. Because from every state you have, have at most four neighbors. Right? And many of them are not there because of the wall. Right? But you could you could generalize that to many other I'm gonna give you another network in a minute which is more complicated than that, which has to do with the Jones 38. Okay, but but here is I mean you, you can always think about the maze, but this is completely general. On any network you would have. Okay. So there is a property which is this that uh, I'm going to assume that. I'm going to assume that if you let n go to infinity, there's an equilibrium distribution. Okay. By the way, I mean, one example of Pij, I didn't write it down. I'll just write it and then erase it just because I don't want. But one example of Pij would be to do this. When AIJ is just an adjacency matrix, which is a proposal matrix, and this is the metropolis asking criterion that you use if you do metropolis asking. Okay, that's one way to do it. You could actually do that in the main, which is that you just propose something which is one of the neighbors, and then you impose a probability, that, that then you would get that this is the occurring probability. I'll erase that. It's just to make a connection with metropolis asking for those of you who know. In the middle is asking the pi is e to the minus beta some energy. I'll repeat that in a minute. Because we will need that for the Lena Jones, but for time being. Okay, so we're going to assume that this is true, so that as 
uh, time goes to infinity, we converge to a distribution, which is a stationary distribution. This stationary distribution has to satisfy this equation, which is the same as this equation, except that uh, by definition, you need the probability when you are in this stationary distribution, the probability should not change anymore. Right? It's the limit. So that means that this guy at n plus 1, this guy at n needs to be the same. And so you just get this quantity where you replace the mu j and mu i by pi j and pi i is equal to 0. Okay. This is true. So far, I have not assumed detail about at all. This is a global. It says that from every in every node, at equilibrium, the probability that comes in is the same as the probability that comes out. Okay. But there is another condition, which is called detailed balance, which says that you can have that this is not true. This is true individually, by pair. But this is true. This is saying that if, if this is state i and this is state j, this means that the joint probability, so this is the probability at equilibrium to be in i, and then to be at the next time in j, the probability to do this, is the same as the probability to find the system in state j, and then that it will go to i next. Right, so this is called detailed balance. And that's de uh, detailed balance, sorry. And by what I just explained, you see why it's also microscopic reversibility. Okay. Notice that this condition, right, in Applies that one because it's the one without the sum, right? But 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 the converse is not true. This is just saying, right, that if I look at one state i and I look at all of its neighbors, what comes in, right, is the same as what comes out. But it could come in one way and come out the other. Okay, here it can. The way you come in is always the way you come out. Okay. So we will assume that too. We will assume detailed balance. Now, it, to make the connection with what I discussed in the first lecture, well, this is really a linear algebra problem. Because I was telling you, you know, when you look at diffusion, the difference of operators is a bit complicated. But here, the, the, the operator, the generator here, the equivalent of the generator, is this matrix P. So if your state space is finite, this is just a finite matrix. And if it's a finite matrix, then I can I can just look at this. Uh, this is matrix P times vector V is equal to lambda times uh, matrix P times vector phi is equal to lambda times vector phi. Right? This is the eigenvalue problem that you would do for a matrix, and and so and then this gives you the spectral <coughs> decomposition of the matrix. Okay. It is like this. Uh, because it's a specific, I mean, so you can, so, in principle, if you want to do a spectral decomposition, you need to look at the left and the right and the vectors of the matrix. But this matrix has, has specific properties, which is due to this, which is that it is self-adjoint if you weigh it by, uh, by, by, by the equivalent distribution. So that guarantee that the, the left eigenvectors, which are these, are the right eigenvectors of P, are the, the left eigenvectors can be related by multiplying the right one by the equivalent distribution. So this is in fact left eg, uh, right eigenvectors, left eigenvectors, and the eigenvalue. Okay. And these properties, this is called uh, parent Frobenius theorem. It implies that matrix that are they have this property they are called um, positive matrices. Right? Matrix that they have this property. You are guaranteed that the spectrum is inside the unit uh, ball, and in fact, if you assume that, all the eigenvalues are between 0 and 1. Okay, they are positive real between 0 and 1. In fact, these eigenvectors, eigenvalues, are the equivalent that before we had, I, I should have changed the notation, but before we had eigenvalue lambda k, and what was making things go, you know, was this. Okay, if you take t equal 1 in this expression, Right? This is essentially what you get there. So these eigenvalues here that I, I use the same lambda notation are the exponent are the exponential of minus the previous one. And so the, the one that was zero here corresponds to the one that was one there, and all the positive one corresponds to values of these that are less than one. Yes. Okay. So that's 
I think these are the. And then once you have the spectral decomposition, right, you can do two things to do the equation of what you had before. First of all, you can solve the equation that is there because uh, you, you can use this representation. You see that. From the line that is written there, right, you see that if I iterate upon this, to get mu n plus 1 is mu times p, right, is mu n times p. So that means that mu is a vector times a matrix. So that means that mu n plus 2 is mu n times p squared. Okay, more generally, you have that mu n is mu 0 times p to the n right? as, as vectors. You have this position, that mu, so if you view that as a, as a row vector, mu n is the row vector mu 0 times p to the n, where p is the matrix whose entries are the pi j. Okay? And now, the spectral decomposition and the orthogonality of these guys make that it's very easy to compute p to the n. Because the matrix p to the n has the entries which are just same factor here, but with lambda k to the n. Okay? And, and, and if you use all that, you get this <laughs> result that tells you the probability is actually evolving, where ck is just the projection over the eigenvectors of the initial condition. Right? You, use, you project the initial condition over the eigenvectors, and then you propagate, and this gets this. Okay? Lambda k, the first one, is equal to 1. And so that's the one that never decays, and the corresponding phi i is 1 also. And then all of the other lambda k are between 0 and 1. And so when you take successive power of them, they, they go to 0. Right? Take 0 0.5 squared, they all shrink and they disappear. Okay? And metastability would again be that if you look at the lambdas, right now they are like this. There's 0 here, there is lambda 0 which is there, and then you have all of the other lambdas that are there, like this. And the stability would say what? Well, it would say that there is one that is very close to one, and then all the other are separated. Exactly. Or there's a few that are very close to one, and we make this thing. Well, there's a group. Okay? You could imagine that you have something which is like that. There's zero, there's one, and there is one that is very close to that, and all the other are here. Right? For example, so if lambda is equal to that, imagine that. Lambda 1 is 0 0.999999, and this one is 0 0.8. Right? In, you know, when I take successive power of this, in order to bring this to 0, we take much longer than to bring that one to 0. Right? So that's the same, at this again, meta stability. Okay? At that level. Right? We are. Okay? And then there's the last thing that we discussed is this issue of current, okay, which is that. If I use this decomposition here in the, in the evolution equation, I can rewrite the, the right hand side in this way. Okay? That is just elementary manipulation that uses this actually. But you, you see that I can see that as again, so you can see, you know, um, at the speed level, a current is, is just a network. It tells you how you propagate probability from one edge to another. And this is telling, this is, so this is this, you can call that as a J, you know, a current from node I to node J, over here, right? And so this is the current that you get, the decomposition of this current into the Hagen mode, right? This is the discrete equivalent, I'll tell you, this is the discrete equivalent of, of, of this vector field that was shown here with flow lines right here. I think, question about that, because we, I mean, if this is like, if you understand this, the rest is actually quite simple. So, um, if you look at the maze, let's go back to this. Uh, do, do I have, a, well, I'll, I'll remind you of the main problem. If you look at the maze, okay, so of course I could simply do the spectral decomposition of the maze and see what's going on. But if you do that in the maze, the way I phrase the maze, in fact, um, they, so I, unless I, I do a, you know, some cavity here, some cavity there that remain where the system stays for a very long time, 
the spectrum here might be actually quite of a mess. Because there's many diameter of trucks in all states are always equivalent. Okay? But if I declare this one to be reactant and this one to be pro this square and this square, I should still be able to obtain something where no I, I look at, at this, which is I take this picture and I want to analyze what are the properties of the, the path that go from one to the other. I'm saying I can do that even if there is no better stability though. I can still and, and let's see where it leads us. Yeah, let's look at uh, two, two things. They're actually very simple. Too. I'll have make another picture. Okay, so the first question I ask is what is the probability at equilibrium that if I pick at that if I pick a state i, I will find a trajectory there which is such that it is reactive, meaning that not only is it there, but it came from A rather than B, and it will go to B rather than A in the future. Right? This is, you know, if I if I ask, right, what's the probability to find the, the system there and that it be reactive, meaning that it's red in the picture? That means what's the probability to find it there to begin with, at the program, and that it will go to B in the future and came from A in the past. So you can, I mean, no, no, like once you appraise the question, you can just give it a, you know, an answer immediately. You just need to introduce one object, which is this committer function that you have seen probably in the talk of bar. So I'm going to introduce the committer function. So the way I define it is simply the committer is defined. It's also the P4. It's, it's called also capacitor. It's, it's the probability that the trajectory starting from I will reach next the product rather than the reactor. So I could imagine doing it to, to compute this. We compute it otherwise, but in a, in a different way. But you could imagine to do the following experiment. You start the system in this square here to try to find what is the QI there. You start the billion trajectory and you count what's the proportion of them that go there rather than there. And that gives you QI. Okay? We'll get, I'll give you an equation for this in a minute and we can even derive it during the workshop if you're interested. Okay, so if I know that, then I can just use my cogenity. If I ask, at the equilibrium, what is the probability to find a system in a given state? But I know what it is. It's phi i. And then, I, I don't know if it's past and it is future, and I ask what's the probability that it be reactive on top. So, what's the probability that it be, that it be reactive? I just told you already. It has to go to be in the future rather than a. So, I need to multiply by a factor q. And then I had that in the past, it needs to come from A rather than B. But the past is the same as the future, because we have microscopic reversibility. So I can ask us to that if we go in the future to A rather than B, it's the same. And of course, the probability to go to A is 1 minus the probability to go to B. So this is 1 minus Q. Okay? Very simple. Okay. Now, this object here was the joint probability of equilibrium to find the system at i then j successively. Okay? So I can ask the same question about the joint probability among reactive trajectories. So I'm not looking at all trajectories that are in i and j. I only count the ones that went to i from a and arrived in, in from j went then to b. Okay, same little thing. So it's, it's just that it's a it's two nodes connected by an edge along a reactive path. Right? Same argument. Okay, This gives you the probability that you are i and j. And then this is the probability that from j you go to b and that you came to i from a. Okay, So that's a joint probability to find a reactive trajectory at i and j. And, and now if you have that, you can compute the current. right? The way you compute the current is you count all the ones that go the edge in one way, and you subtract all the ones that go on the edge on the other way. Okay? So that gives you this. And uh, because this is an intersymmetric object, right, you, you, can, you can take only the positive part. So you get, you get this. And you can see that um, if, if you make one minus the other, what will remain is that. I can do this little manipulation. If you look at uh, 1 minus qi times phi i, qi 
find j, q, j, and then you subtract the one where you change j and i. Okay? Well, you see that this factor here is the same uh, is the same as this one because of the tail value. Uh, so I can factorize it. And then what remains? It remains one minus one minus so it's qj minus qi qj, that's this factor, minus qi plus qi qj, so this two simplifies, and I just get the little factor that is here. Okay? And you see that actually this is reminiscent of something. It's uh, oh it was the next slide. It's not this current here, except that they have replaced the, the eigenvector by the commuter. You see, it's exactly the same expression. If you replace the eigenvectors by, by the commuter, you get the current that I'm talking about here. So right? there's no other way for it. Right? <laughs> Not another thing, of course, which is that <clears throat> there is no current at equilibrium. If I, if I, if I do this minus this, since they are equal, I get zero. And again, that's because anything that comes one way comes goes the other way. Once I look at reactive trajectory, the system is automatically out of equilibrium because I have introduced a source at the reactant and a sink at the product. So clearly, the trajectory are all going from A to B. There must be a net flux. Okay, so. I think that the analogy here is again with is actually quite interesting, right? which is that what we are doing here, what this object is, if you wish, or the continuous equivalent, I'll discuss it in a minute, is that you can imagine that there would be a tap in this corner that I open extremely hard so that there's a lot of water coming out there, and then the, the room is closed, but there is a sink in the other corner over there. So if if the, you really make a lot of water come true, there will be a turbulent flow that goes from one state to the other. But I mean, that if I look at any given point, I want to ask what's the velocity of the, 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 the water there, it will fluctuate wildly, there will be a swirl and whatever. But I can make a probe somewhere, and I can average the velocity here. Okay? And what I will get is I will get something which is such that this average velocity field will go from the source to the sink. Because at the end of the day, if you average, there is, you know, 100 liters a second that is coming out there and it's going, it's coming out of there, and, you know, it's being extracted over there. At st when you reach a stationary state, right, everything needs to flow through. So I will have, what, so you can think about the individual little particle of water doing this as the trajectories, right? And this average is probing the trajectories at the point get the curve, okay? Except that in the equilibrium system, it's like you stir the, the water, but there's no source, no sink, so at the end it just goes around, and imagine there's no friction, it keeps running forever, but there will be no net velocity. If I want to probe how things go from one state to another, I introduce a source and a sink artificially, which is what it's done, and then I get the reaction, okay? So we had that. Okay, so, um, the, the, I'll derive that maybe during the workshop to not spend too much time. You can write down an equation for the commuter, which is very, very easy. Right? It's very easy to write it with the equation itself. But you can write down an equation which is quite, quite easily, and the equation is here. I'll, I'll derive it for you in the workshop. Okay. In essence, it's saying that you just look at the template and use Markovian. Say from state I, I either jump directly to B, that gives me a contribution to the, the committed. Well, let me let you let you write that. No. Suppose I'm in state I, right? and I want to go into B. I want to compute the commuter state i, q i. Right. So this can happen in which way? Either 
I go directly from I to B. Okay, so this would be P I B. B is one specific state in the system. Or I go to another intermediate which is not B. Not A, because if I were to go to A, I would already be out. And then from that state, I need to go to B first. So this is the equation for the commuter that you can write down. And then if you use the property of P and you, you know, manipulate this a little bit, you'll get okay, so The way you derive it is actually extremely simple. Right? It's saying, uh, we repeat, you know, from I, either I go directly to B, or I go to J first, which is not A and B, and then from there I still need to make my way to B. Okay? So you're using the Markov property to decompose the event going to B into going to B directly or going to B to an intermediate. Which are this, you know, uh, independent of probability, so you can sum the probability. Okay? Manipulate that a little bit to get the Let me show you what it so the sigma takes care of any number of intermediates, right? Uh, the, the sum, yes. Yeah. You sum all possible intermediates, right? So you see what happens is that if you now you put the boundary condition, you say okay, so I can finish this to the calculation if you want. Right? This is what's happening here. If you say, well, if you let that QB is equal to one, if I start from QB that's that's why I'm already and QA is equal to zero because if I'm in A, I don't go to B first, I'm in A, right? You see that I can eliminate this restriction because if, if J was equal to A, this would be equal to zero, okay? And then what you can do is that you can, you can put J back in, J equal B back in, which gives you this term. All J, P I J, Q J, then I need to subtract P I B, Q B. So Q B is one, and so this guy can sell this one, and then you have the equation which can Okay? It was too low for people in the back, but uh I can do that. I mean it, 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 it's a So here's what you do, if you do that on the maze, here's what you get. Actually useful to do it. I'm going to do a complicated maze in a second. And here it, it was this like I don't know if you see the color or not from the back. Ah, maybe it's good enough. So, okay. So here is what what was known. Remember, I declared this to be the this square is the product and that was the reactant. Okay. So when you construct these maze, I actually have a program to do that. It, 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 they are only that. So, but if you, you so if, if you have this maze, right here, you have a P that is given to you, and in this case, I think it's 40 state by 40 state, right? So the state, so it's 40, 40 by 40. So the state space is 40 square, and so this matrix is a 40 square by 40 square matrix. It's not that big. You can, you know, do all you want with this kind of matrices. In particular, you can solve. The equation for the commuter. If you do that, you get this. So now every square in the maze gets a commuter value. And what was done here is that we are just colored from 0 to 1. So you understand that if you're very close to the product, it's much more likely that you will go to the product first, so that's why it's close to 1. And very close to the, um, the reactant, it's very likely that the worker will go to the reactant rather than the product, so the commuter needs to be equal to 0. Okay, so that explains that. No, no, I'll try to explain the rest of the maze so that you understand that this is actually giving you the right reaction coordinate and then the path. Okay, so I'll explain to you in a minute how I got this path, but for time being I can tell you, so I, I hope you see the little arrows. This is in this maze, this is the single path that you can follow that brings you to from entrance to exit without ever having to go back on yourself. Is the one productive path, right? And the reason in, in, the, in any given system there might be more than one way to go from exit to entrance, 
The reason why there's only one path in this is because the way I generated this maze is by taking a program out of the web that is generating maze to do games, and in these games you want to have one answer, not more. So that's why there's only one path. Okay. We can have more than one. Just, we'll look at more than one in a minute. Okay, so I'll tell you in a minute why I got this path. But for the moment, and I really should add this arrow, but try to look at the committer value here on the square that follow the path. And if you do that, you will see that the committer value along this path is, is increasing monotonically, in fact linearly, from this point to this point. I mean, it, go, you know, it goes from dark, blue, oh, here is, here is, here is. Okay? But then there is many, many regions that have the same color, so meaning the same committer, as the value <coughs> of the committer along the path. And that's simply because uh, there are many regions that are dead ends in this system. Okay. And, uh, for example, if the walker at this point, it's a random walker, it doesn't know where to go, had made the wrong choice and go down instead of going right, then it would have ventured in this big region here, which is a whole dead end. There is no way to get out of this region and, and go to B, rather than coming back for at this point and then continuing again. So that means that the committer value of all of these states is the same as the committer value of this state, because this is where this is, this is the only place, I mean, eventually you need to get back there to go back on path. Okay? And so, all of these patches that have the same color tell you along, along this path what are regions that are equal committers, that are all the dead ends that are connecting to this path. Because in this sense, again, this is, this is telling you, it's giving you a metric on this maze that is telling you how far you, you are at any given state from the exit. Okay? I'll go back to that and make a remark. So this is, I'll, I'll say this is a reaction problem. There's many remarks. So I'll, I'll discuss that. But now what is this? Well, remember we computed the current. Okay, so this current, uh, it's here, but I can compute this current here, okay? So this is something, right, where I can take a, any pair of nodes, and then I can put an edge between these two nodes and color it or make it thick with respect to the amplitude of this object. So already you know that because Bij is non-zero only if you are among states that are connected in the maze, you can, there's only certain places where you can put this arrow to begin with. Right? But in the original maze, there's many places where you would have Bij as non-zero over here, for example. But now there's this guy that, that comes into play that tells you that you will have an arrow only if Qj is, is it should be Qi, it's Qj minus Qi, it's a mistake. It, you can only have an arrow if Qj is bigger than Qi. So there is only an arrow among states that are connected by this, and which are such that if you go from one to the other, your committer value is increasing a little bit. Okay, once you understand that, you realize that oops, the only place where you can have a current then is along this one productive path. Because at any other place, right, the committer value is not increasing. You are in a dead end where it's actually complete. Right. This again is a bit of an artifact. In, in general, you have more than one path, it would not be you know, as black and white as it is in, in this picture. But in this picture, it's very clear that so the, the path here is not obtained by me searching in the maze. It is simply by solving the commuter equation and plotting the curve of the reactive trajectory. And the only place where there is a current is along the path. So I can pull the current and go into the maze. Okay? So now, there's many things that I need to say here, which I, 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 I want to, to, to avoid. First of all, you need to realize that, again, this current here is an object which is much, much, much simpler than the trajectory themselves. If you were to look at the reactive trajectory, in fact, this reactive trajectory in this example are astronomically long. Because if you really wait that the guy comes in there and go all the way to B, there are so many ways to not do that, that it takes an enormously long time. And so the reactive trajectory are enormously longer. If you were 
try to compute the Kominka not by solving this equation, but by generating reactive trajectory using, for instance, TPS, and then averaging the current at a given node to find this, this is impossible, even in an example like this. Okay, I, I say that if they try, it is, it's impossible. You will never get the statistic that you need. All right, that's one thing. Now, the other thing is that they, you see that there's a difference. This is a reaction coordinate, and this is a path. Again, they are connected to one another, but this has values everywhere, and this is only something that goes along one given path. That's a distinction. I'll make this distinction again. Okay. A, a few other things for those of you who do MD that can be illustrated in this example. You see that the reaction coordinate that we, is used here is quite complicated. In particular, this point here is much further from the exit than this point. Since it's coming to a value, he's essentially zero, and he's already 0 0.7. But you might not know that a priori. For example, there is, when you do MD, often you, people use theory. You say, well, I want to bring this structure to this structure. I'll just push it that way. But when you push in high dimensional space, you need to know how to push. So what you do typically is that you use the root mean square distance, for example, between the two structures. Nothing tells you that this is actually going through the right path. Imagine that in this example, just to make a cartoon, I would have decided that since the exit, the entrance is here, up, and the exit is down, to accelerate things, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bias the, the walker by making it go down more. Okay? Well, if I do that, what I would do is slow down things more than accelerate them, because what I will do is I will actually push my system into this dead end where it will stay forever. Even worse, if I only monitor this reaction coordinate, which is the height here, I will think that when I'm there, I'm already alive. Even though I, the system has done nothing, it has just gone into a dead end that has the same root mean square distance as the exit, but it's completely, you know, uh, different and with no connection whatsoever. Right? This is why, I mean, you actually, you know that because if you do, to push the system one way like that, even very, very slowly, you can often have that you go to a structure that has a very a root mean square distance very close to your target, but then when you compute the free energy along it, you see that it is increasing very, very high. That is saying that you are going into something which is not where you should be going. And that's that. This is the same example. Okay. Another little comment which is kind of interesting. Transition state theory works. Know what the reaction coordinate is. But in fact, when I say that, you should say, but not really. Because <coughs> where is the transition state in this made? The best candidate value you would say for the transition state is the commuter one half, which is somewhere here. This is indeed the point where you have midpoint on the maze. Right? So if I if if you were to be launched here in the maze, okay. It, you have the probability that you go there, rather than there is half, so it's much higher than the beam. It, 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 it. But unlike what you had in nice energetic example, where the transition state is at the top of the hill and from there you just need to go down the hill on either side, here you have no idea where to go. There is no information in this transition state. If I drop you in the middle of the maze, that doesn't help too much into going over. If the maze was on a big hill, then yes. But if there is no hill, which is this case, then no. Right, so that's said that transition state needs to be actually um, used with caution. That doesn't mean that the little cartoon that I used at the beginning is wrong. Because later we're going to compute free energy according to this reaction coordinate. So we're going to slice the system according to the committer value. And then it becomes one dimensional and you have a very nice value. Because it has to. Right? But this requires a very long process in which it would be quite hard to guess this reaction coordinate to begin with. Okay? Okay. This all seems to be um, quite academic, but here's an example where you can do the same. Where well, you I'm, I am I'm cheating a little bit because I'm using the result that I've been collected for 20, 30 years by David Wade. 
that is to make the analysis uh, the connection. So this is a so this is the problem of the reorganization of the Lennard Jones clusters. Have you you have heard about this problem or not? Okay, so Lennard Jones, you know. Right? So they can interact and they they come. So if you think about putting Lennard Jones, if you think about the problem of self-assembly, if you put Lennard Jones particle at sufficiently low temperature in the in the room, eventually they will uh, find one another and they will form a structure where they are all together if you are below melting or, or evaporation. Now if you think about what will happen is that two guys will glue together like this. Then a third one will form a triangle. Then one will come on top and you will get a tetrahedron. If you try to build structure from tetrahedron, you're going to get an icosahedron, like a Mackey icosahedron. That's the structure that you get if you keep. Okay? So if you put 38 particles like that, what you get by self assembly this way, what you should get is this truncated icosahedron, which is but this structure, it turns out, when you have 38 particles, is not the one that has minimum energy. There is a structure that has a lower energy than that, which is an octahedron, because it has FCC. So the FCC, right, it is FCC based, and the FCC is such that this is more densely packed than the one that you have given here. Okay. So this is a problem that has been analyzed for a long time, because connect with self-assembly, which is, and, and you can make connection with the protein folding. It's a problem in which the system naturally goes into a state. It's dynamically, it's first attracted to a state which is not this ground state, it's this guy. But then, if you are low enough in temperature and the number of particles is right, 30 is one of these magic number, from this structure you can go to that one. And this is, if you wish, it's like it, there's a big region in which this guy is at the bottom. And then there is a narrow, like a, a funnel, well, where this one is at the bottom, and this bottom is low in energy than this one. If you increase a little bit of temperature, this can become the favorable state because of entropy. But if you go below uh, right temperature, then this is always the one that you should see. Okay, so what. Um, David Wells has been doing for many, many years is that he has analyzed the landscape of this object. So he has identified all of the local minimum and southern point between that you can find on this energy landscape. Okay? When I say all, you can already say that this is impo it's impossible to find them all, simply because just make a little calculation. Uh, if you look at this system, there is 38 particles, so I can imagine a pathway where I change any one of these particles into any other. That's factorial 38. That's a big number. But you know the number of critical points is bigger than that. Okay. In fact, it's much, much bigger than that. Anyway, he has obtained you know, a, a low dimensional cartoon of this landscape. So you can do, so you can think about this as not like a little bit of metropolis. So I'll, I'll explain that, like that. You can imagine that you move on this landscape in this way, which is um, so you have a network, right? Where the network are the local minima. So now every node here is a local minima, meaning a specific configuration which locally minimizes the energy of the Lennard Jones cluster, and it has a certain energy. Okay. And then some of these configuration you can go from one to another by a minimum energy path. So there's a little subtle point that and only one that you need to cross to go from one to the other. So now you can introduce a stochastic matrix. So if I look at the at, there's an agency matrix, AIJ here, which just tell me which one of these guys are connected to which. So AIJ is non zero only if there is a minimum energy path that on one path, on one step, go from one to the other. Right? And then I can do metropolis, which is, uh, you could imagine the dynamic where you, 
you pick a node at random, if you're here, you pick a node which is among the ones that are connected to it, like that. Okay? And then you propose a move to that node, and you accept it with Metropolis asking depending on the energy. Right? So th this essentially means that you take this PIJ. This AIJ, this is what you propose. And then you do the minimum between E to the minus beta IJ plus beta I1. Meaning, if the energy of the state you're gonna, that you're proposing is lower than the energy you started from, you always go. And if it's higher, you only go with a probability which corresponds to the Arrhenius rate, the, 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 the Arrhenius weight between the two. Okay? You are familiar, I suppose that you are familiar with. So if you do that, on the network of, so if, if you do this on the network proposed by Wales, you are turning this problem into an analyzing <coughs> maze. It's a complicated maze. It's much more complicated. The number of states is in the thousands, uh, no, in the, in the millions, which is much, much higher than this. But you can still analyze it. If you try to do a spectral analysis of this, it's actually it's a mess because there's many, many groups of small n values. But this is a case where you know what are A and B. This is A, this is B. And so what you can do is you can, and this is what these little figures are, is what was done is, is a collaboration with Masha Cameron. I'll give the name. I'll, give, I'll put reference on this later. Is the committer was computed from this. If I root four in like linear algebra, uh, and then the current was computed, and once you have the current, just in the same way as in the maze, instead of computing reactive trajectory or trajectory, I can just follow the current to generate productive path. If I were to do that, recall that in the maze I would get something boring because I only get one path. But in the Leonard Jones, you get many, many paths. Okay, so you can analyze what's going on, right? And maybe I can show this figure first, which is um, oh, I, yeah, actually, so it's not the figure that I wanted to have, but it's almost <laughs> the same, uh, right? So these histograms. If you generate many productive paths, and then you look at the statistics. All of these paths have the property that along this path, the commuters are using free. There's no loop. They are direct. Okay? So you can add, you can count along the path how many states do you have. And you see that um, you get histograms where you see that there are the n which tells you the number of, of states that you have in the path. In fact, what's that, what is happening, maybe I should show this. What is happening is that you can find out, so this is the representative path that you get at very low temperature and at higher temperature, where what is happening is that at very low temperature, everything crystallizes into this one single path for this system to actually reorganize itself. Because anybody else is much more likely. But when you go into higher temperature, slightly higher, then you start adding many, many paths that do the same job, and you can analyze what's going on and start doing statistics. For instance, what's the highest point that you reach along this path? How many states do they go through, etc., etc. Okay. We can discuss this more during the again during the workshop if you want, because this is an example that you can decode quite easily, and that show you that you know, for instance, the zero temperature path here is the equivalent of the minimum energy path, but this is not the path that is being taken, even at temperature where the system remains extremely metastable. But it's slightly higher than this competing path that allows you to go many different ways through your game. Okay? How am I doing with the time? Okay. So I'll discuss this example more maybe in the in, in the in the workshop or in the third lecture to indicate a little bit how it was done. You know, how we get these representative paths. These are representative paths at, at low temperature that tell you how the system reorganizes itself. You can't see, just saying, I have moved it. That all, 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 you know, the, this all little puzzle is moving around to go from the acrodragon to the octagon. Okay? Now, of course, um, 
this manipulation that I did with in the discrete case, you can do in the continuous case. And you can define the probability density of the reactive trajectory and a probability current. This probability current here is again something which has the same structure as the one you had seen based on the Eigen function, except that you have replaced the Eigen function by the committee. Okay. And then you can use that. Uh, here's an illustration. This is a version of the Muller potential that probably you have seen, except that I had made it drag. So we put a little wiggle so that it's, it's like the Muller potential, but there are many local minima and maxima. Okay. And if you take a temperature which is such that the bias between the, this region and this region is much more than kT, a few kT, but kT is of the order wiggles, right? you can do exactly what you were doing before, which is you can look at uh, the flow lines of the current, they are these lines, and then you can color them according to the, the amount of current that they transport. Okay, and this is what you get. It says most of the reaction will go through this channel. Okay. Here are a few illustrations of, of, of things that are uh, that, that you can get with this that are actually not so trivial, even for low dimensional example. This guy here is the one you saw before. And you remember that if you were to take you know, the, the current that is associated with the, the, the one of the Eigen function, you will get something that looks like that. If you don't do it through the Eigen function, but you do it through the committer, upon choosing these two states as A and B, you get essentially the same result. This is something which can be proven, actually. You can show that if you place the sets at the right place, and there is metastability, the committer will be a way that probes specific Eigen functions. So if you wish, it's a way to zoom into this, this tower of the spectrum at one specific level that corresponds to a reaction. Uh, so again, uh, I didn't show you the committer, but this is the, the, the blue line. So the red line is a reactive trajectory. The blue lines are the flow line of the current. And, and this is their way that, in such a way that most of the current go through this way. Okay. This example shows you that you are erasing, the, I mean, this is showing you that you're erasing delta. You see that there is no current that ventures here, because that's like a delta in the main. To go there, you need, the system needs to come out anyway. So the current is concentrated on the productive part of the path. This is an example that shows the same. You have, you have two deep minima here and a bar in between, which is fairly high. But then this guy here has a, is connected to another state which has a higher energy, that's a minimum, through a barrier which is slightly lower. So what's going to happen is that there is a reaction going on between these two states that is much more frequent than the, the main reaction between these two. So if you look at the spectrum again, there would be one eigenvalue for here, one eigenvalue for there. If you identify this as being the reactant and the product, these two main states, the current will go to this channel completely. And you will erase the fact that there is a dead end there. The dead end actually, the information of the dead end is in the committer, but not in the current. Okay. This example is an example which was already used by people doing max flux by Mac Hammond, I think, or, or stroke, I don't remember. It's a triple well potential, deep minimum, deep minimum, and an intermediary here. And it has the following property. The saddle point here, this saddle point has a lower energy than this one. So that means that at very low temperature, the system will go through this channel because this is where the global barrier is the lowest. And if you look at the current at low temperature, this is what you get. Most of the current goes this way, but there's a little remnant. If you start increasing the temperature, then there is an entropic switch, which is that even though the, the energy barrier is here is a little bit lower, well, this is a two-step process with a dynamical trap in between. Okay, at some point it becomes more favorable to hop into one step because it's energetically not as good, but it's entropically better. And indeed, if you do the, the same type of calculation by increasing the temperature, you know you see that you get that. The slightly higher temperature, all the current is through the lower channel. Okay? Uh, okay, so what we're going to do tomorrow is like.
you, you are all interested in practically the short term in this exam. You can spend a longer time analyzing them. It's actually quite nice. They are quite fun. But, but what you learn from them in terms of molecular system doesn't go beyond the cut rule. You would really like to be able to do this on ND system. So I need to tell you how, how to calculate these things under specific assumptions uh, in more complicated systems. So that's what we're going to do in the workshop and in the last lecture. Uh, uh, just uh, forget about this calculation. We're going to compute path that involve doing things like this, which are actually quite similar, I think, to pictures that you may have seen in the talk of Philippe or collaborators, but this is really the string method. Yeah. So, and, and, and this is how to compute the path and then have a reaction coordinate that is associated with it by doing some sampling. And the way we're going to do that, for example, like that, is this is low dimensional, but we're going to try to identify points that are in the middle of this tube, okay? And, and we're going to do that. I'm just showing you this um, little bit of propaganda as the title of the next lecture. And you're going to explain what you do. We're going to start this point at, at, at the given location, and we're going to see in the movie is that we're going to be, divide the system into cells. We're going to do sampling in the cell, and as we do sampling in the cell, we're going to move these cells to put them in the right place, okay? And it will do this. You move the cells. You see that. I hope you can see from right. Every cell has a little walker that is walking around, in yellow and, and, and uh, white. And you, there is a rule that tells all the worker evolving they need to evolve in these cells by ND, and how the evolution can be actually used to move the cell itself until everything converges. And when it converges, let me show you the movie again. So we started. Oops. Right, you start with a straight line and then it kind of bent it formed and it went into that state where the picture that was on the previous slide is just the final result for the center of these cells and, and just like the last thousand image of what the walk in the cell were doing I'll actually show you this caterpillar is in fact the transition path. Transition two. And that is a slicing into a reaction coordinate of your system. Okay? So again, this is cartoon. I'll tell you how to do this. I'll tell you to give you the code. The code is available to, to do this. And then you, the question is how to apply these type of techniques on MD systems. And I'll show you how to do that too. Okay? Voila.